Hello my friends, how are you? I found a parish, so I'm recording from New York from a parish close to my to the hotel where I'm staying. And the pastor very nicely has landed me in this room. So we're with the Divine Mercy Jesus and with our mother behind accompanying us in this meeting. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being with us, for calling us to eternity, for sharing all the richness of your truth, your life, your goodness, your mercy. Help us to listen to your word, to receive with care, with attention, the gospel of the coming Sunday, to ponder the words just like Mary did. Blessed Mother, be with us, intercede for us, so we can be open, we can trust in Jesus more and more. We can be filled with his light and his goodness. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for interceding for us permanently. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, my friends, we're going to share a beautiful gospel today. The coming Sunday gospel is the fifth Sunday of Easter. And if you remember, we have seen the apparitions of Jesus, the first three Sundays. Then the fourth Sunday of Easter, we saw and we meditated on the Good Shepherd. Always a Good Shepherd Sunday is the fourth Sunday. Because being the shepherd, he is the one who leads us through the dark valley of death into the eternal lands, into the eternal grass of rest and joy and light. Now we are going to meditate on the John chapter 14, which is within the, the farewell discourse of Jesus. You know the farewell discourse of Jesus is between chapter 13 and 17. In the Last Supper, just after the Last Supper, Jesus starts this farewell discourse, which he's going he's gonna to open his, his heart to his disciples. He's going to open his heart to us. He's going to show us the mystery of God. Okay? It's beautiful because it's like a last testament, what he's saying, what he's doing. And he's been, been very sincere, very friendly, very open. We want, he, he wants us to really trust in him and see that he's not holding back anything. Okay, my friends, let's, let's read the, the verses. So it's chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, the first 12 verses. He starts in this way. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. Just with that beginning, he's saying, a, he's saying us a lot. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He can see that these guys, the disciples, can sense that death can be closed for them. Okay? So it's do not be afraid of your very, of fragility. Do not be afraid of sickness. Do not be afraid of loneliness. Do not, do not be afraid of persecution. Do not be afraid of death. You can also ask yourself, what thing can you be troubled with? Do not be afraid. And then he says, you have faith in God. Have faith also in me. What he's saying with this is, I am also God. Okay? So the, same, the only thing that can cast away fear from your heart is the faith and the trust in God. And I am God. I am not only a preacher, a prophet who is pointing towards God, which is what we see in the Old Testament or what we see in other religions. I am not just suggesting you a way, a path, a practice, a spiritual discipline. Trust in me so you don't have fear. It's the same as we saw last week with the Good Shepherd. If, we are, if I am with my Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd is with me, there is nothing I shall want. I will not be afraid. Okay, so fear and is opposed. The enemy of fear, what casts away any fear, is the presence of Jesus. The trust in Jesus, directly. Jesus, I trust in you, of, of Faustina, is the only thing on earth that can cast away fear. And then he says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. So beautiful. Many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? There are many dwelling places, and one place is for you. And then he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself. 
Do not be afraid because you have a place in the heart of God. Because you have a place in the house of my Father where you are going to be with me. What is going to cast away fear? Jesus is confessing his love for you. It's a desire uh, that he has for communion with you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Many dwelling places, place for you. You know, one place has your name in the heart of Jesus, in the house of the Father. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come back again, take you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be. And you already know the way. So what he's saying, why in Easter where we meditate in this? What he's saying is, the fear of the fragility of this life can be anything, because we can be scared of many things. But he's saying, put and fix your eyes, your hearts, and the house, and the destination. Okay? And he's saying, in that destination, you have a place. We can ask ourselves, um, but... I mean, since when I have a place? And why do I have a place? I am a human being, I am like billions of any other human beings. Why am I unique? What makes me unique? And why, how can I know? And why, why is it that you have a specific care for me? And I'm going to share you a meditation on C.S. Lewis, about um, C.S. Lewis talking about heaven. It's in the book called The Problem of Pain. And he says the following. Be sure that the ins and outs of your individuality means the ins and outs of your individuality, your uniqueness, okay, are no mystery to him, to Jesus, to God. And one day there will no longer be a mystery to you. So many times you can ask yourself, why am I like this? Why am I different? Why I have like three talents and not five or not ten? Why I'm good in this and not in this? Why I feel like this when I see the ocean, when I see the skies, when I see the sunlight, when I see flowers? Why I vibrate so much inside myself when I listen to this kind of music or this kind of painting? Why am I unique? Why is it so difficult to be understood? You know, the last week Jesus was saying, I am the only one who can know my sheep and my sheep know me. He's saying there's a kind of, com of communion and connection between the sheep and the shepherd that nobody can have. Nobody can really understand the sheep, just the, the shepherd. And now he's saying, in this dwelling place that has your name in the house of the Father, he's saying, uh, C.S. Lewis is helping, is helping us to understand. One day that mystery of your uniqueness, the mystery of yourself, will be revealed. He says, the mold in which a key is made would be a strange thing if you have never seen a key. And the key itself is a strange thing if you have never seen a lock, because one is made for the other. If you only see one part, it's a mystery when you don't see the other part that has been made for. Your soul has a curious shape. Your soul has a curious shape. Because it is a hollow made to fit in a particular swelling in the infinite contours of the divine substance. Or a key to unlock one of the doors in the house with many mans mansions. Your soul is like a key meant to unlock one of the, of the doors into the, into the house of many mansions of the Father. Your soul is meant to open the heart of the Father in that specific place that has your name. Why are you unique? Why do you have that unique name that nobody else can understand? Why you have that identity that no other human being can really grasp? Why you feel loneliness many times? Why your uniqueness makes you feel sometimes lonely? Well, that is beautiful. That fact of being lonely, mysterious, misunderstood is in itself a treasure if you listen to this John chapter 14. Because it is saying, you have been made to unlock one of the mysterious doors in the house of the Father, a space in the heart of God. You are not meant to be revealed. Your mystery is not to be revealed or unfolded here on earth. You belong to somewhere else. That is beautiful in itself. What Jesus is touching is the mystery of your identity, not being revealed here. 
Your place in heaven will seem to be made for you and you alone, he says, because you were made for it, made for, made for it, stitch by stitch, as a globe is made for a hand. Just as a globe is made for a hand, you were made for it, stitch by stitch of your soul, of your spirit, of your depth, of your infinite profundity, has been made to fit in the globe of God, of the heart of Jesus in the house of the Father. Whoa! What Jesus is saying with these words is the mystery of your depth, of your authenticity. The search for your true self is being revealed. And he's touching the longing for the house of the Father. Why you should not be afraid and troubled when you are threatened by sickness, by misunderstandings, by death, by infirmity, by anything, because you are not from here, because nothing is going to take away the fact that you are going to open the heart of God, that you are made for Him. Feel the voice of your name from the Good Shepherd saying your name because you are meant for Him and love and embrace the mystery of your uniqueness, of your loneliness, of your mis being mis misunderstood. Okay, so that's the first part of this gospel, but then comes the beautiful part, that then one of the disciples is going to ask him, it's going to be Thomas, he's going to say, okay, Master, we do not know where you are going, how can we know the way? Okay, so we have been talking beautifully, Lord Jesus, about the destination, about this longing, this nostalgia, this like pain for the Father's house. Nostalgia means that is this pain, which is a beautiful, healthy pain, not like melancholy, no. Nostalgia is good because it moves you towards, lifts up your heart towards your home, towards the house of the Father. That's nostalgia means that. Algia is pain, right? And nostos is the house of the Father. And then comes the question of Thomas. Thomas has great questions. It's healthy. I mean, he, Thomas never asked about this the way. We have never about, had this definition. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Beautiful. This sentence is one of the seven I am's in the book of John. He has seven affirmations of him being the I am. When he's saying I am, he's throwing us back to Exodus chapter 3 when he said to Moses, I am the one who am, right? I am who I am. When Jesus is taking that introduction, he's saying, I am the one who is God, the existent mystery that sustains every being, that gives every being existence beyond and transcending creation. I am the way, not one way, the only way. Okay, so first he talks he talk about the destination, the ending, the goal, and now he talks about the way. So it seems very interesting because Thomas asked about the way. I am the way. Why he can be the way? Just because he connects both ends. Heaven and earth. God and humans. He connects. He saves and overcomes the abyss, the chasm, the infinity that disconnects human being from God. Sin from the purity, from the holiness of God. Only him, him can save the, the, this abyss. This is beautiful. I remember when I was right now in, in January, like doing the, I was hiking in Peru with, the, with some missionaries that went from here, from the U.S. And one day we were hiking a very high way, like four hours going to a glacier. It was very demanding physically and suddenly I remember I was leading it from my group. I was in the front and I just was so tired and there was a bifurcation. There were many ways to go to follow, two or three. I don't know exactly how many paths. And then... I stopped there because I said, I mean, I don't want to keep on walking in vain. So suddenly a girl came behind me and just followed one of the tracks. And I asked, hey, do you know, are you sure this is a track to the glacier? And she said, yes, I'm sure because I have done it in the past. I have done it this and I do it every year, she said. We had a great conversation afterwards. So that gave me so much serenity because this person has done it before. Because this person has already arrived to the goal. Who can tell me, who of all the human beings can tell me which is the road to heaven if it's not somebody that has already been there and is coming back from God? So it's beautiful. What Jesus is telling us is, 
I can fill the gap because I am coming from heaven. I am God. I know the way. That's the mystery. It's so beautiful. He can be the mediator between God and men because He is in itself holiness. God. It's very interesting because I remember I once analyzed, uh, I mean, I read a text that was saying what difference, what separates us from God is in, in one sense nature because we're created, He's the Creator, He's divine, He's infinity. The other distinction that the other thing that separates us from God is sin. He's pure. And then the other one is like death, and He is eternal. It's beautiful because in Jesus, nature is overcome when He's incarnated. Sin is overcome by His death and His crucifixion. And death is overcome by His resurrection. He can be the true way because He has overcome all these three barriers that separate us from God. I have this music on the back, I'm sorry, because it's getting distracted a little bit. I'm in the church, so I was not expecting this. Um, so, and then he, so he's going to be the, the one who saves this, 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 this abyss. Something also very beautiful is like he is in this aspect of being the mediator, the one who unites in him these two ends. He's going to be the bridge builder. I remember the Chronicles of Narnia and the voyage, the, the journey or the voyage of the, of the dawn trader. When the kids finally arrive to, to the land of Aslan, and they ask him, Aslan, how are we going to be in touch with you? Because we have to go back from Narnia to our life. And he says, don't be afraid, don't be troubled, because I am the great bridge builder, which in Latin is pontifex, pontifex, the one who builds up the pontix, which are the bridges in Latin. I am the one who saves the distance. Beautiful. And then Jesus keeps on explaining this, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father, he says. From now on, you do not know me, and I have seen him. Master, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Have I been with you for a long time, and you should know? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Okay? So what he's saying is, I live in the Father. I draw life from the Father. And in the same way, if you receive me, my friends, I will leave you and you will draw life from me. What he's saying is, I will become the fountain of life if you receive me. In the sacraments, we are receiving the Jesus, the fountain of life. And he himself is receiving life from the Father. That's why he is a mediator for us to arrive to the heavenly house. And in a sense, if we are already with Jesus in our hearts by the sacraments and by faith, He is already in us, living in me. I am already living and experiencing home right now. I am not a homeless. And that means I am not orphaned. If I receive Jesus in the sacraments, I am receiving my home. I am receiving not only Jesus, but the Father who is in Jesus. So He being the mediator between heaven, between the Father and us. Him driving life from the Father. And we here driving life, draw, sorry, not driving, drawing life from Jesus. What He wants is to live in us. And He wants to prepare His dwelling place in me. So I can feel at home. The experience of feeling at home right now is the goal of Jesus. We don't have to wait to die to feel at home. It's right now here that we can feel at home. And in that way, our dwelling place for eternity is being prepared. It's getting ready. Okay, so I want to ask you right now, just for a spiritual reflection. When was that time or that context, that place or that conversation or that Bible quote that made you feel that God was that person that you were longing for, that God was your intimate, that God made you feel at home, that you no longer felt a stranger, that you felt, this is me, this Jesus is my home, this love makes me feel myself, I'm no longer a stranger to myself, and God is no longer a stranger to me.
What is that specific quote that makes you feel at ease, makes you feel belonging to God, being known by God, that makes you feel good with yourself, like connected with your authenticity, with your identity? You see the washing of the feet? You see Jesus telling to Mary Magdalene, Mary, what are you weeping? He said Jesus in the Last Supper saying, Remain in me, remain in my love. I don't know, there has to be something. A quote, maybe from a saint, maybe from the gospel, that made you really feel that God was your house, that God was intimate, friendly, close to you. And I want to end with a beautiful quote of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4, 7, and that says, There is no great nation which has gods as near to it as our God is to us. There's no other nation which has God so near to us, so close to the human being as our God. When he's saying that he's the absolute way, truth, and life, that's our blessing. Because he at the same time is building that intimacy. We don't have to build up our identity. We don't have to fight to defend our identity. We have to accept it. Accept your name. Accept your place in heaven and your place right now on earth. Accept your home and the destination. And accept that home right now, intimate. Accept right now that the only one who really makes you feel known, makes you feel in family, makes you feel familiar and in peace with yourself is Jesus, the only one who can unlock the mystery of your heart, the mystery of your longings. Yeah, I encourage you to live this adventure of yourself, of finding and, un and unlocking the mystery of yourself. Only through Jesus, the mediator between God and us. I want to see if you have any questions. Oh, the document I was reading is from the problem of pain of C.S. Lewis when he's talking about heaven. Okay? So the pages repent on who is, on which is an edition you have. It's a beautiful quote. Yeah. Gail says, always love this quote, and I really, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. I love this quote so much, and I'm going to share with you that it's a very special quote. Uh, because when I was in my, my ordination, you know, my ordination was August 15th last year. Uh, so, Archbishop Chaput, the, the gospel for that, for that day was the Magnificat, the Visitation of Mary to Elizabeth. But what was incredible was Archbishop Chaput in the, in the homily said, I don't agree um, that the God Magnificat is the best passage for this, for the Assumption of Mary. And he said, and I was surprised, like, what are you doing in my ordination? You're changing the scriptures. You're fixing the church. So, and then he said, the passage that I think is the best for this one is in John 14. And he said this passage specifically. What was crazy for me that touched my heart was that in my retreat for the ordination, one week before that, before the ceremony, um, like I decided to meditate on a quote close to my heart and I picked this quote and this quote really really I don't know, opened a mysterious space in my heart really made me tremble it was yeah it was so deep and then this happens right one week after that Archbishop says this is the most beautiful quote and then, and then he explains why for the assumption because he says because when Jesus goes to heaven and he's going to prepare a place for each one of us. To whom do you think is going to be the first person for whom he's going to prepare a place in heaven? His mother. His beloved mother. So the assumption related to this quote, him preparing a place for mom. And then he looked at me and he said, Now, Remy, this quote in your donation, I think God is asking you as a priest to help Jesus prepare the place that each one is meant to fill in the heart of the Father, in the house of the Father for all eternity. I think we can really long for that and we can really think about helping Jesus and Mary to prepare their dwelling places in heaven. If we prepare people to receive Jesus, to receive home in their hearts, immediately, simultaneously, their, their home in heaven is being prepared. That's what I think. 
and we are all connected. I mean, when we see a person, we should see the dwelling Jesus inside. We should not see only a person, we should see the divine. We should see like the, the shrine inside. Meant to be filled, meant to be habitated, cohabitated. We are cohabitated. We are not singles. We are not loneliness. Okay, my friends. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, all my friends. Linda, bye bye. God bless you, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a beautiful Sunday and a beautiful Easter season.